for being in your place. And let's go ahead and start out uh, the service with Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We'll sing all three verses to this. It'll be on page 285. 285. Let's stand and worship the Lord. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. to have you in the service let's keep singing standing on the promises 323 we'll sing verse 2 1 2 and 4 1 2 and 4 standing on the promises of christ my king through eternal ages let his praises ring glory in the highest i will shout and sing standing on the promises of god Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Excuse me. <laughs> when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all and all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. You may be seated. So glad you're here this evening. Good to have Lori with us tonight. Thank you for being in the service today. We had uh, Pastor Seth Green, uh, his children, in the service this morning. I, I, I know you were uh, paying attention to the young man up here, and uh, two of his other children were in junior church. They had several cases of COVID that sprang up, and he's just coming off uh, surgery and doesn't have his voice back. So pray for Brother um, Seth Green and Kalamazoo Baptist Church um, that uh, they'll be able to resume services as soon as they can and uh, that the Lord would give Brother Seth quick healing and so pray for them. We've got several things that are coming up on our calendar. First of all, we'll mention our tithes and offerings and so uh, be faithful to those. Certainly be faithful to your faith promise giving for missions and, uh, and then your prayer time with the missionaries as well and thankful for the opportunity to partner up with 
these servants of the Lord that are going into all the world and preaching the gospel. And um, so uh, thank you for your faithfulness there. <clears throat> I'm a little raspy and sneezing. Um, this happens twice a year, spring and fall. And so I get all this uh, allergy stuff that happens to me, but you persevere anyway, right? There'll be no allergies in heaven, amen? And uh, so wonderful. But uh, we've got our business meeting coming up on uh, April the 18th. And so that is tonight, isn't it? And so as soon as Pastor Tyler's done with his long-winded preaching, we'll get into our business, <coughs> our business meeting. And so uh, be in your place for that. Um, and then also next coming up, Amber, keep me going, spring cleanup. Uh, we're doing spring cleanup and fence day on the 24th. And uh, the time is 10 o'clock that we'll meet here. Uh, ladies, you'll be working uh, on the inside. Fellows, will be working on the fence. Now, uh, if it's crazy cold, uh, you know, I saw, how many of you saw the Facebook model of the amount of snow that we could possibly get on Tuesday night? Do you believe it? <laughs> They're saying like nine inches. It's crazy. It's ridiculous. It's a European model and you can't trust anything coming out of Europe. Amen. And uh, so, um, but anyway, I don't know. We might get some snow on Tuesday. I don't know, but just crazy weather. Uh, it may rain on Saturday. If that's the case, um, we will bump cleanup day to the following uh, Saturday, which will be May the 1st, same time uh, for that. Our focus night, third one coming up on May the 2nd. And so uh, I've really been enjoying those. I hope you have too. It's really just kind of pushing us out of our comfort zone and trying to get everybody that's engaged in those focus groups just um, doing those things that are necessary to get yourself out in, uh, you know, with your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, and try to build some relationships uh, for the sole purpose of spreading the gospel. And so uh, be, be in your place for that. That's May the 2nd. Uh, also, uh, April the 25th, uh, coming up next week, we'll have Pastor Brian Jackson with us. For the whole day, you'll be preaching our Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday evening service. There is no meal in between the morning service and the evening service. Um, we're still kind of just <clears throat> doing uh, as, as, as little as we can to keep stuff safe. And, and so um, we're going to take them out. They're dear friends of ours. And so they're going to be uh, here with us and um, preaching on friendship, faith, and fellowship that's our theme for the year, so it's just kind of this power up Sunday to keep us uh, moving forward and challenged in the area of being a personal witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Mother's Day uh, brunch also coming up. I can't believe that we're talking about Mother's Day already, but uh, May the 8th um, at 11 o'clock here at the church, the ladies will be having a Mother's Day brunch, and so be inviting uh, your moms, and uh, if you are a mom, invite your daughters, and uh, is there a sign-up sheet for that? And so there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and uh, please uh, fill that out and be ready uh, for that. Now, teen retreat is coming up. It's very early announcement, but uh, the teens are wanting to work for uh, earning money to go on their um, uh, uh, teen retreat, which is kind of a spiritual uh, getaway, just unplugging from the world, their normal routine, and, and just uh, you know building in the Word of God and, and relation ship wise with one another and growing that bond in the youth group and so uh, if you have need of some work around the house that you have and you'd like to hire some of the teens please see pastor tyler those dates are july the 29th through august the first but um, they need to have the deposit in in may is that right by the end of may which is a hundred dollars and so if you're planning to have some work um, please see pastor tyler on that um, I think that's all that we have. Um, the Mother's Day cost, I forgot to mention, is $5 per person, so um, be mindful for that. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and uh, have a word of prayer. I, I, I put my wrong, wrong one on here. Here we go. And uh, I think that's all of our announcements, so let's pray and ask God's uh, blessing on the service tonight. And you pray with me. Lord, thank you for the privilege to gather together in your house. Lord, we don't take that lightly, or, or at least I don't. And I thank you every time that we can open up your word as a body of believers and learn from it. Thank you for challenging us 
in it. And uh, Lord, especially what we've been learning in Genesis, Lord, the magnitude of your word, uh, Lord, the power, the continuity that it has. Uh, Lord, it's not uh, disconnected, uh, independent thoughts, but Lord, the unity that you have painted in your word to see uh, so that we could see your magnificence and how you've put all things together. And uh, thank you for teaching us that. And it certainly increases our faith and adds to our stability. And your word is, is our source of strength and power uh, because it's from you, it is you, and your spirit in us uh, teaches us continually. And so thank you for that. Thank you for the message and the messenger. And uh, Lord, continue to open our hearts and minds tonight as we get into uh, the book of Genesis again. And may you be glorified and honored in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take your Bibles, open up to the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis. Got, we're going to be doing an interesting story tonight. One that um, you might be thinking as we go through it, why is this relevant? Why are we spending so much time on this? And hopefully by the end, you're going to fully grasp it. Uh, but Genesis chapter 9 is where we're at, and been enjoying going through uh, this story and this book of the Bible, and really been very helpful to me. Uh, hopefully it's been a help and a blessing to you. Uh, but I do got quite a bit of slides to get through tonight, and we have our business meeting, so we're going to jump right into it. Genesis chapter number 9, starting in verse number 18, we're going to read down through verse 29. It says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. And so uh, this next part, we've uh, broken this, uh, this book, uh, or this chapter specifically down uh, into its different parts. Um, and so tonight we're going to be talking about the curse. There was a curse that was given to Canaan, the son of Ham, for the act and the transgression of his father, Ham. And so tonight, or tonight we're going to be getting into this story and kind of uh, exploring it and figuring out exactly what does the Bible say, because this is a story that a lot of people get to and they make their assumptions, which is sometimes okay, but... Uh, it's a passage that we aren't always emphatic about, uh, and so we're going to do a little Bible study tonight. It might be a little more uh, technical than what some of you are used to, but we got home folk here, and I think most of you enjoy the technical aspect of some of this. If not, just bear with us, uh, but we're going to get right into it. So the curse. First, uh, in the verses we start about, we talk about the peoples of the earth. And I'm just going to spend a brief moment here because uh, next week I'll get into a little more in depth how that unfolds, the Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their descendants and how they come out. But uh, the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. So very quickly, just again reminding everyone, uh, God is once again pointing to the fact that this was an all-encompassing flood. Right, because from Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all the whole world would be overspread. It's kind of as if God knew that one day this would come under attack, that this was not a worldwide flood, but a 
partial deluge, as some people might say. But God is once again emphasizing in his word, listen, the whole earth was overspread by these three sons. All right, so it's kind of like God knew what he was doing. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. And know that Ham received the blessing, so the curse was passed to his son. Uh, this is very interesting. A lot of people, when we get into the story of Ham and Canaan, wonder why Canaan was the one that was cursed instead of Ham, the one that actually did the transgression. Well, at the beginning uh, of the verses that we read and at the beginning of chapter number 9, it said, And God blessed Noah and his sons. It wasn't just Noah. God gave them a blessing. And when God gives a blessing, he doesn't take it away. I think of another good illustration of this is the story of King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a great king and someone that followed after God. But near the end of his life, he fell. He slipped. He started going away from God. And God told him that his punishment would not be on him, but would be on his descendants. And we know Hezekiah's uh, very shameful response that he had to God, as long as it's good in my time, as long as there's peace in my time. I also think of Saul, the very first king of Israel. A lot of people don't understand this. Before his act of transgression of not killing all the Amalekites, and before that happened, Saul had another big transgression that took the kingdom away from him. He offered a sacrifice before Samuel came. He took upon himself a role that was not his. And the result of that wasn't necessarily a direct punishment to Saul. It was on more so Jonathan, his son. Because at that moment, the king, the lineage of the kings, was taken from Saul and would be passed on to David. Uh, so there are instances in Scripture when God has blessed somebody that when they fall, the curse and the punishment then goes on to the descendants of that person. And so this uh, is another instance of that Ham has received a blessing. Canaan did not. Canaan received a curse on his father's behalf. And so uh, I might be getting a little ahead of myself, but that's a quick note to keep in mind as we go through the rest of this night. night. The earth's population comes from these three sons of Noah, three major racial groups and three major language groups. And we'll quickly go through these. Uh, starting with Shem. Shem is the Semitic or Asiatic languages. And so from the Middle East area on over uh, through Asia is the group that Shem and his descendants would have populated. There is a little bit of overlap in uh, Ham and his descendants as well. Uh, the Afri Ham has the African language, uh, Niger and Congo area, or the Afro-Asiatic language family of Northern Africa was formerly called the Hamido-Semitic group. So uh, some of these names might be a little difficult to say, but this is the other half of the Middle East down into Africa. Obviously, the Middle East is going to have a lot of overlap because that is where God works with them. That is where uh, most of the Word of God is set in, and takes place in, is that Middle East region. So Shem goes out to the east in Asia. Ham, <coughs> excuse me, Ham settles down uh, in Africa, and then we get to Japheth, who is the Caucasian or Indo-European languages. He settles from uh, the Middle East area over to the west into Europe, and then uh, from then on into America, which is kind of a melting pot of all three of these. We have uh, quite a wide variety of races here in America, and it is all coming from these three sons. And so... Uh, at the end of the passage, or next week, we'll get into a little bit more detail about these sons and uh, the promises and prophecies that God gave to each of them. But for now, we're understanding uh, how God is going to set up uh, history and what we can follow through. Then he moves on to Noah. Noah has stepped out of the ark. He has worshipped God. He has built an altar. He is having a good run so far in this new world. He's done very good. And he becomes a husbandman. He begins to become a husband or someone that manages and tends to a vineyard. This is uh, interesting. This is not a bad profession. First of all, we should understand this. This is actually uh, future telling because in the New Testament, uh, the word husbandman is used quite often in parables to refer to Jesus Christ and his people. And so Noah becomes this person that is tending to uh, a vineyard and is tending to the grapes. But unfortunately, he gets drunk on his own product. 
And so uh, I have on the screen, it never pays to get liquored up. And uh, Genesis chapter number 9, verse 20 through 21, and Noah began to be an husbandman and planted a vineyard. And he drank wine of, the, and he drank the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And now, before I go on, I could have spent a lot of time on this word husbandman, and we could have gone into a more in-depth study. If you would like to do that, you can, because this is the very first mention of the word husbandman, but not the last in Scripture. And so, uh, but for sake of time, I wanted to uh, go through and didn't go through a lot of the husbandman. We're just going to hit it and move on. And so, husbandman uh, is one defined as one who plants a vineyard. And what's interesting is that Noah may have been surprised about the intoxicating effect of the wine, right? It is not ever mentioned before. This is the first time wine is mentioned in Scripture, and you don't ever see it before talking about its negative effects. Um, you don't see anything about it. Grapes were a natural thing because Noah is someone that started to plant uh, a vineyard, so it seems like he might have had some uh, understanding of uh, being a husbandman before and starting this planting, but the earth's atmosphere changed as we learned uh, at the end of chapter 8. Seasons came into place, the weather has changed, um, and the climate is different because of the catastrophic flood that occurred. And this would be consistent with Noah's character as a just man. Uh, it's not something that Noah would, uh, we would think that Noah would have done knowingly that he was going in and going to get drunk with this, but it is something that happened. And so we see the story, Noah, he drinks, he gets drunk, and he uncovers himself. And we see throughout scripture, drunkenness and nakedness will go hand in hand. When one is mentioned, it is not far behind that the other one follows. And this is um, going to be picturesque of how God is going to deal with wine later on in scripture. Uh, it's also picturesque of how God and Satan work. Satan unclothes, God clothes. Satan's goal when he was with Adam and Eve, Satan got them to eat the fruit so that their eyes would become opened and they would see their nakedness and their standing before God. God had to then clothe them. Noah, partaking in drunkenness and becoming drunk, makes himself naked, Satan, uh, through the working of Satan, and uh, his righteous sons, Shem and Japheth, have to then cover him again. And so we're going to see these two go together. Lamentations 4.21. Uh, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that thou that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse 15 through 16. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the, thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. And thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. And so uh, nothing good uh, mentioned here about the drunkenness and when those that either receive it or those that give to others to get them drunk. Uh, so that they can look on their nakedness. These are two that go hand in hand. Intoxication tends to lead to sensuality. Uh, in cases of Lot, Genesis chapter 19, verse 33, and his story in Sodom and Gomorrah, wine led to uh, a very sensualistic crowd in Sodom and Gomorrah. Ahasuerus, in the story of Esther, when he's having his party and at the very beginning of the book, and he gets drunk and calls for his wife Vashti to come and dance sensually for all those that are in attendance. And then the story of Belshazzar in the book of Daniel, chapter number 5. He, uh, again, he gets drunk with his people, and all sorts of sexuality and sensuality occurs in the throne room, and then God's hand comes and writes uh, on the wall, uh, giving, passing down judgment. And so, looking through the word of God, um, there's a lot negative to say about wine. There's a lot negative to say uh, about drunkenness, and there are those that will uh, come out and right, have their different views on wine. I'm not going to get into a lot of that today. All we can say with absolute certainty is God doesn't have a high opinion of it. That's absolutely sure in the word of God, and uh, Noah, unfortunately, a very just man, falls because of this vice. 
uh, and a very uh, disturbing scene will take place. So that brings us to Ham's sin. Ham's sin. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time. And you might be thinking, I don't know why that's so important. He did something wrong and his son got punished. But what I want to do today is take this from a biblical study standpoint. Because what we are going to do in this passage is we are going to stick with the text. We're going to stick with the text and see exactly what it is that this passage says and compare it with other passages and look at the comparisons and contrasts. So Genesis 9, 22 through 24, we'll see the actual sin. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And so uh, we're going to see the sin that occurred here is that Ham saw his father's nakedness. That is the wordage that this passage uses. And so what I'm going to do now is we're going to give, uh, I believe I have four different views of what could have transpired by taking this and comparing it with others. The very first is uh, saw nakedness. You could take a rabbinical view is that Ham castrated his, his father Noah. Uh, this is um, something that would be in Jewish terminology, something that would be used. Not one that I think of in particular, um, but it is a common theory that a lot of people hold to. Secondly, uh, and most people I think uh, fall under this act, is that Ham slept with his mother or stepmother and Canaan was the offspring of that union. And that is why Canaan receives the uh, curse is because he was the offspring of a sinful act. Um, this is another way to view Leviticus chapter number 18, which we will get into uh, in just a minute. And then a third saw the nakedness view is that Ham was involved in a homosexual act with his father while he was drunk. Uh, and then the last one is that Ham saw his father naked and responded with disrespect. And so we're going to look at a few of these verses, a few of these um, ways and other passages where this terminology is used because the best way to define what God says is to look at other places where God has said the same thing. And so starting in Proverbs 30, 17, the eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagles shall eat it. This is in response to the disrespectful uh, terminology. The key is understanding the word, to understanding the word of God is to pay attention to the context and the words of Scripture that are used. God says that the words of the Lord are pure words. Every word that God says is pure, and every word that God puts into the Bible has meaning and has purpose. And so we're going to compare verse 22 and verse 23. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both of their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. The key here is that Ham was out of bounds with a look. Out of bounds with a look. And this is why we're going to get into this, because a lot of people will take this verse and become emphatic on, it was definitely this sexual act that Ham did, and that is why God judged him so hard. But when we look at the context and the wordage that God used, God said that Ham saw his father's nakedness and told his brethren. If at the least, if at the minimum, that was what transpired, then God is saying, because of the look, because of what your eyes saw, harsh judgment follows. And I think a lot of people try to turn this passage because when you think that just a look can get you in that much trouble, that brings you into a lot of different trouble in a lot of other passages. God is very serious about sin. God is very serious about what he has instituted and about his judgment. And a lot of people try to escape judgment and justify their actions because I didn't actually do it. Right? I just saw, or I just looked, or I just thought. And so I didn't, it's not actually sin. Well, in this case, Ham, if 
it, if it was just a look, which is what the Bible says, he was out of bounds with that look. So, what about Leviticus 18? This is where we see uh, the best uh, comparison chapter to go with this because it talks about uncovering the nakedness. But in Leviticus 18, the words are different. Uncovering versus seeing nakedness is the difference between it. Uncovering is a transgression of the law described in Leviticus chapter number 18, verse 6 through 8, dealing with sexual sin. Uh, read the chapter. None of you shall approach to any that is near kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. And so in this passage, we understand it boils it down to at least two things. Either Ham looked at his father naked or he looked at his father's wife or his mother naked. Uh, both of those would be correspondent and accurate with Leviticus 18 because the wife of thy father is thy father's nakedness because in marriage God says the two flesh are now one. And so Ham uh, either looked at his father naked or his, uh, his father's wife naked. But in this uh, this in Leviticus 18 through 6, verse 6 through 19, all but one verse uses the causative form to indicate improper sexual behavior. Now, uh, if you are a grammar person, you know what this means, but causative form uh, means that when someone uncovers, that is, if I am uncovering something, I am the one that is causing the action of uncovering. If I see something, it's still a verb, but I'm not doing the uncovering, I'm looking at something that was already uncovered. But if, I, if, the, if the Bible says that Ham uncovered his father's nakedness, that means that Ham was the direct cause of what made his father naked, which, as we know, the cause was wine. In fact, the Bible says that he woke up not from his sleep, he woke up from his wine, which I thought was very interesting that he said that, uh, meaning that this was not a, uh, a good thing, it was a sinful act, uh, the drunkenness, he woke up from the sin, uh, not from a normal sleep. Uh, but this causative form to indicate improper sexual behavior. Uh, verse 6 of Leviticus 18, None of you shall approach to any that is near kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife, thou shalt not uncover it. It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness shalt thou not uncover. The nakedness of thy son's daughter or thy daughter's daughter, even their nakedness shalt thou not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. She is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter in the law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. Also thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. All right, and so in these passages, God's very specific. Right? And this is very uh, serious about sexual sin. God has several verses where he is telling his people, right, there is a way to do it. And if you don't, it is wickedness. Right? This is something that is getting very lost in today's society. Sexual sin is as common as the next thing. Right? And people get uh, tangled up and twisted in a lot of it. God said all the way back then, listen, this is how you are to act. This is how you are to conduct yourself. You don't look at your father's nakedness, your mother's nakedness, your brothers, your sisters, 
anyone related to them. Now, uh, a lot of people also will take this passage and say that it does not apply to Noah and his family because of the uh, responsibility and the commission that was given to them. You remember, there were eight people after the flood. Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their wives. All right, And so uh, some people say that this does not come into play until the nation of Israel when people are already established and you can get away from uh, the nakedness of thy father, the nakedness of thy mother. I don't believe so because Shem, Ham, and Japheth already had their wives. Right? It would have been different had they not had uh, anyone else and there was only like an Adam and Eve situation. Uh, but nevertheless, that is out there. You might hear someone bring that up. However, Noah had already uncovered himself in the story. The, the reflexive form in verse 21, and Ham saw him in that way. So Ham did not do the uncovering, but he did see it because Noah himself uh, put himself in a position of sin. The Hebrew expression here means what it says. Ham saw his father's nakedness. You can see a typical connection uh, through tying Ham's sin to sexual deviancy. And notice that the uncovering the father's nakedness is mentioned first. The context of Leviticus 18 uh, is the doings of the land of Canaan. Uh, and the uncovering of Leviticus 18 is defined in Leviticus 20, verse 11 and 18 through 21 as sexual sin. And so getting to the bottom of what could have transpired, Leviticus 20, verse 11, and the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man shall lie with a woman having her sickness and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath discovered her fountain and she hath uncovered the fountain of her blood. And both of them shall be cut off from among their people. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor of thy father's sister, for he uncovereth his near kin, they shall bear their iniquity. And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness, they shall bear their sin, they shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness, they shall be childless. All right, so very interesting that in the future, this sexual act of uncovering the father's nakedness results in a childless existence. Right? Uh, obviously, that did not happen to Ham. Ham did have a son, uh, Canaan, uh, from his, uh, it's the son that is mentioned. Uh, they had multiple sons, but this one mentioned by name with a curse. And so, again, bringing us back to the fact of understanding the text, Ham saw he didn't uncover the nakedness of their father, uh, but the nakedness of the father, that terminology does refer to a sexual instance. So, San, uh, Ham might have been viewing a sexual intercourse from his father and his mother, uh, could have been seeing the nakedness of the father. Um, but there is a connection also between homosexuality and the old world of Noah's day. And we've mentioned these, 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6, uh, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Judges chapter number 1, verse 7. And Adonizabek said, uh, I think that's actually supposed to be Jude. Uh, let's move on to Matthew 24. Uh, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This takes us back to Genesis 6. When we tell uh, the uh, sons of uh, man and mingling with the uh, sons of God, mingling with the daughters of man, uh, and the homosexuality of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sexual sins that were prevalent in the days of Noah. Um, Ham would have been privy to these and would have known the, the lifestyle of the world that was before the flood. Uh, they would not have been ignorant to that sin uh, and to what had transpired. 
Just because God destroyed the world and destroyed the people does not mean that the memories of the old world were gone. Noah and his family would have still known, would have still been able to experience and know about these sexual deviancies. Um, and so, again, I'm bringing these up to point out all the possibilities of what could have happened uh, in uh, trying to determine and read this text. But, again, remember, Ham did what the text said. But remember that looking is out of bounds. Looking is still out of bounds. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. And so... Uh, God does not just judge harshly the act. God also judges the look. And so uh, even, even a look is out of bound. A good example of this is Old Testament priests. When Old Testament priests go up to the altar, they could not go up by steps, allowing people to see up their robes because a look is off limits. A look is out of bounds, and God was very careful to make sure that no one would be able to see uh, going up, Exodus 20, 26, Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Ham's brothers have God's heart. Genesis chapter 9, verse 23, His brothers cover him just as God covered Adam and Eve after they were beguiled. Uh, and here's where a lot of people have their issue with the fact that it just being a look and Ham just looking at his father nakedness is verse number 24. Noah wakes and knew what his younger son had done unto him. All right, and so now we're getting into, uh, it seems a little bit of contradictory wordage from the word of God, and we compare uh, 9.22 where Ham saw his father nakedness to, uh, in this passage, Noah knowing what he had done unto him. And whatever happened, it was at minimum disrespect for his father Noah and at some level, you can see it would, it would have been sexually deviant as well. Uh, but you cannot be emphatic from the text that there was some kind of sexual attack. Uh, you don't know that he wasn't sexually improper. You just cannot prove that from the text. And so uh, you say, Pastor Tyler, why are we spending so much time on the wordage of this? Because I believe it's important that we understand exactly what it is that God is trying to say from his word and that we don't try to add our own spin onto it. I think that has become a very dangerous place that churches and pastors and Christians have gotten to is that we read the Bible and what we don't understand, we then put our spin on it. That's one of the reasons we have so many different biblical translations that are out there now because, well, you know, it was such old reading and it was such old language that we can't possibly understand it now. So what we're going to do is read that and now we're going to modernize it and understand it. But in doing that, they can change and put their own spin on what a verse says. You see the, the challenge in that, and you see the danger of that, is being able to change God's word, where in our minds, well, maybe God's not super specific in what happened. And say, all right, well, then I can say, right, well, it was this for sure, and so everything else was fine. If it was a look, it wasn't. It was actually a sexual act, and so, right, what I'm doing is fine. Um, let's take a good example of this. We're talking about sexual deviancy. There's a lot of men out there, uh, and women too. I'm not saying that women can't be involved in this, but predominantly it's men. Uh, the act of pornography. A lot of men would be fine with it because, listen, I'm not actually cheating on my wife. I'm not actually going out and being with someone else. All I'm doing is looking. There's nothing wrong with that. According to the word of God, looking is out of bounds. God says you're not to uncover the nakedness, you're not to look at the nakedness of anyone else that is not your wife. A look is out of bounds. But now we've gotten ourselves to the point of being able to justify our actions and being able to justify uh, looking because, right, I'm getting right up to the edge but not going over. And isn't that unfortunately how Christians live their lives now? I can get as close to the world as I can without going over, and I'm still fine. If we were back in Christ's time, 
Christ would not have that view. Abstain from all appearance of evil. In fact, is what the Bible says. And so, in this passage of Scripture, we can look. It definitely says that Ham's sin he saw. Noah said he knew what his son had done unto him. Several possibilities of what could have happened there. Noah might have realized that he was naked beforehand and was then covered. right? Or, understand this, Ham told Shem and Japheth about seeing their father. Noah could have woke up and Shem and Japheth would have told their father what had happened as just children, is what should have taken place. And so knowing what his son had done unto him doesn't necessarily inf uh, indicate that there was a sexual act done, but could have been a reflection of my sons told me what happened and now I know. Um, or, as I also mentioned, could have been the same. But from the text, it understands saw was the sin of Ham. Looking was the sin of Ham. This principle, uh, well, why was Noah so harsh with his curse? That's where I really want to end today because I think that this is important when we understand how God judges sin, right? When we look at why Noah's curse was so harsh on Canaan, we understand, oh, well, it was a sexual act and God despises sexual uh, sin and so it was a harsh curse. It's possible. But God is also just as harsh on what we consider the small sins. Think about this. This principle can be seen in Acts chapter number 5. Ananias and Sapphira, they lie. How many of us in here have told a lie? How many of us in here would say that you have lied to God? I would say probably most of us at some point. And we know how God judged Ananias and Sapphira. They dropped dead immediately for a lie. Here in this passage, God is showing the danger of disrespecting your parents. Ephesians 6.2, God says to honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Exodus 20, verse 12 says, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And yes, even the danger of sexual deviancy of any kind. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. God has a much higher view of looking than I think we give him credit for. You see, what Christians do is we use that as a scapegoat. Well, I didn't actually do anything. I just looked. Why would God be judging me so harshly? Well, God's word says why. To look after a woman to lust is to commit adultery. Now, what I want to do is I also want to take this and anytime you deal with sexual sin in the word of God, you might say God always deals with sexual sin more harshly, it seems, than he does with others. And that is because the relationship that God has pictured between us and himself is a husband and wife relationship. So when you talk about committing adultery and fornication and to look after someone else to lust after hath committed adultery already in his heart, as believers, we, are, we will be married to Jesus Christ. He is our groom. We are the bride of Christ. And we have a bride that is constantly looking at this world for satisfaction, for gratification. We are constantly looking and lusting after the things of the world and rejecting God. And you might say, well, you know, Pastor Tyler, I don't actually do the sins that we talk about. I don't actually go out. I just occasionally think about it. I occasionally ponder it. God says, listen, it's the same thing. Whether what Ham did was just seeing and disrespecting his father or his mother, or whether it was an actual homosexual or sexual act that he committed, God judged harshly both ways. Because God's word is not something to be taken lightly. God's word is not something to be twisted to fit our narrative. God's word is absolute and is to be followed. And he makes sure of that as he goes throughout scripture, especially in dealing with these sexual sins, because the same applies to us in our relationship with God himself. 
We look and we lust after the things of this world. Pastor's been talking about Sunday morning, the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. How many of us lust after the things of the flesh? God says, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the works of the flesh and the lusts thereof. There's the danger of looking that we overlook. But God does not. And I think it's very important for us as Christians to take a good examination of our life and don't try to justify your actions. What we need to do is we need to grade ourselves. Like we were back in school and occasionally your teacher would let you self-grade your paper. Right? And you look at it and you say, oh, well, you know, I got the same answer, but I didn't use the same process to get there. It's okay. Right? If any of you did pre-calculus. Right? That's not, what God, that's not what we need to do tonight. We need to look at our lives and say, where is it that I am out of bounds just with my look? Just with where I set my affections? God says, set your affections on things above not on things of the earth. Mortify the flesh and the lust thereof. Because we're not righteous because we don't do the sin. Sometimes we can be just as out of bounds thinking about doing the sin as we are actually doing it. And I think that's why a lot of Christians struggle in their Christian walk. Say, well, God, does, God hasn't been blessing me, and God hasn't been you know, speaking to me in the services, and I don't get anything from my Bible reading. It's because your look and your gaze is elsewhere. You're looking after another man, not Christ himself. And that is the big sin of Ham, was that he saw. He looked somewhere that he was not supposed to be looking. David looked and beheld Bathsheba bathing herself. Achan, before he took, he saw the gold, the silver, the Babylonian garments. It all started with looks. Their sin did not occur the moment that they took. Their sin occurred when they looked. And that led to other sins in progression. God says it's out of bounds when you look. Your eyes need to be fixed and fastened on me and no one else. And so let's take that in mind as we go through and we learn the story of Ham and Canaan and the curse. Let's make sure that our eyes are where they need to be and they're set on the Lord Jesus Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As we begin our invitation, I know it was a little bit of a different message and might have been a little hard to follow at some times and very technical, but I hope that at least you got the main idea of what I wanted to, trans to get across with this message. We need to be careful what we look at because God will judge that just as harshly as some of the things that we actually physically do. And I think we have too many Christians out here that try to justify our actions because, well, I didn't actually do it, Pastor Tyler. I just thought about it. You can't come down on me that hard. Right? You can't tell me that I'm sinning, Pastor Tyler, because I didn't actually do the act. I just I pondered on it for a while. Ham saw his father's nakedness. And because of that, his son and his lineage received a very severe curse that they would be ser servants forever. Out of bounds with a look. How many of you today might think in your mind, Pastor Tyler, there's been some places in my life where I've been looking in the wrong places. Maybe I haven't actually done anything yet, but my, mind, my eyes have just been off of my Savior and onto the things of this world. And I need to get my eyes focused back on where they need to be. I need to set my affections on things above. I need to look at my Savior, look at my husband, 
Jesus Christ, to keep my eyes fastened on him and not go looking after the, the nakedness of this world. As we stand to our feet, heads bowed, eyes closed, the altar's open. If you need to do business with him, do so. Truly examine yourself. We say that a lot in church, especially before we take the Lord's Supper, that uh, a man should examine himself, but how often do we actually look and take a good look at where we falter and where we fail? Let's do that this evening. The song that's playing is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Look at Him. Let's not be out of bounds with our gaze this evening. But look on the husband who gave himself, gave everything for us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your house. Thank you for your word, and Lord, being able to open up and study it, and Lord, be really paying attention to exactly what it is that your word says, not trying to change it, not trying to redefine it to fit our narrative, Lord, but taking your word and defining it by your word. Lord, I pray that tonight was a blessing and a help to people. And Lord, I pray that we would make sure that our gaze and that our look is on you, our husband. Lord, not on the nakedness of this world, not to lust after it. But Lord, that we can grow and better our relationship with you. Lord, I pray that we would apply this message to our hearts. Help us to better serve you. We love you and we thank you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Let's just take a minute to use.